So in this video, I'm going to show you the solution of the shoulder MRI case of the MSK Olympics 2025. And spoiler alert, this one is a little bit different than the knee and the ankle and mainly because only eight out of 65 reports were qualified and the rest got disqualified for missing one major finding. And I'll show you that later in this video. So what we're gonna do is we go over the case. I'll also copy the link to the case of this shoulder case into the description down below. So if you are a radiologist, you can go open the case and try to report the case. Use your phone to measure your own time. You can use the stopwatch app on your phone. Measure your own time and see how quickly you can report the case and how you compare to the other radiologists that participated in the MSK Olympics. And you will also find out whether you actually would have qualified or not because only yeah, 8 out of 65 did. So the first thing we need to realize here is that we are dealing with a MRI electrogram. And I think this was a problem for some people because uh, not all radiologists report arthrograms of the shoulder or any arthrograms for that matter, but they could have realized it's one either way because you know you can see this is a T1 sequence based on the signal of the muscle. And you can see this is high signal here. So they could have realized, okay, why is there high signal in the joint? And this could potentially be an arthrogram. Now, let me go over the case from start to finish, how I go with my own search pattern when I'm looking at the shoulder MRI. And then we will see what the criteria were for the assessment of a qualifying report or not. Now, when I start with shoulder MRI, I always start with the shoulder roof. That's part of my template. Uh, we can see there is a little bit of you know, mild degenerative change in the AC joint, but it's not, you know, traumatized or anything. And also the clinical information was just shoulder pain, no trauma. So there's just age related changes here, nothing wrong. Because it's an arthrogram, I'm always interested, is contrast going into the bursa? And we can see there is no contrast here in the bursa. So that's fine. Also, there is no fluid here. When we scroll back, we can see this calcification. And on the sagittal, we can see that there is a little bit of irritation overlying here which is partly also in the bursa so i think this is uh, some maybe some focal bursitis here from this calcific deposit that i will show you in more detail here just in a second but other bits the bursa here is fine so bursa was not a criteria for the report at all and this is basically for the roof now when we go over we also want to have a look at the cc ligaments coracoclavicular ligaments here they are completely normal there's no edema again this was not a trauma case so we don't really expect anything there anyways and then something else we can see in the shoulder roof would be this streaky edema here with some gauze pebbles inside the muscle this is just from the direct arthrogram from the direct injection uh, this is uh, could be part of the local anesthetic some people use it or just uh, not a very clean uh, injection or a little bit of hematoma from the injection but clinically it's completely irrelevant and we don't have to even describe it at all so then the next thing we want to do is going for the rotator cuff tendons and we can see on the arthrogram here when we start anteriorly i always start anteriorly we can see the biceps tendon coming down into the groove now this contrast that you can see here is not a tear of the suprasternatus tendon even this one here is not a tear this is partial volume here from the biceps tendon anterior border suprasternatus junction i'll show this on a second plane so based on this image technically you could dictate a anterior border partial tear articular sided or something like that but i'll show that this is not the case posteriorly it's fine and then we go to the sagittal we start at the medial portion here we follow the my tendon is junction we follow the tendon we see the tendon coming in we can see now the biceps tendon going off and this fluid here around the biceps tendon is actually what's causing these uh, fluid or contrast changes in the anterior edge here so this is just along the fluid along the biceps tendon here and it's not a partial tear or a tear of the anterior portion of the infraspinatus which would be inserting here so this is in a supraspinatus here not infra sorry, supraspinatus now if you want to give a little bit of tendinosis it's fine patient was over 50 years old so it's okay now once the supraspinatus is clear we go to the infraspinatus tendon and here we follow the tendon again we can stay on the sagittal we follow it all the way around and then at the lower portion we can see there's a little bit of edema and in here we have a large calcification it's a signal free structure lobulated typical appearance for hydroxyapatite positions a little bit of peritendinous edema here or intratendinous edema which is consistent with calcific tendinitis also a little bit of bursitis or irritation of the bursa overlying it here now the deposit lies 
most likely inside the tendon and not inside the bursa otherwise we would expect more bursitis to be there uh, some people thought it's in the bursa and other people thought it would be in the teres minor tendon but you can see if you follow the teres minor tendon here and we follow the up this is the top border here you can see the top border comes here and the insertion is somewhere here this is the teres minor insertion so this obviously it lies not in the teres minor tendon but in the infraspinatus tendon now if you wrote it teres minor you would not have been disqualified yet it would still be a qualifying report now go to the subscapularis tendon and think, think there is a that's where the confusion happened to some degree because if you don't realize you're looking at an autogram you suddenly see a lot of fluid you might think okay what's going on is this like a hemorrhage is this like a strain or like a severe muscle rupture and you know there were quite wild descriptions of these findings but in fact, this is just the extravasation that can happen from arthrography here. And maybe the needle got a little bit displaced. Clinically, it's completely irrelevant. This will go away. And if we do the scan or repeat the scan after, like, let's say, like a week, you will not see anything wrong with the muscle itself. So what we have to focus on is the tendon slip. So we follow the tendon slips. You can see we follow the tendon here all the way into the insertion. And this is the lesser tuberosity here. And we have a nice clean insertion of the tendon here. This is bitsy bitle groove nice external rotation of the tendon so the tendon itself is fine then we start to see the mjhl here that's coming over here so even this one is not a tear this is just the mjhl insertion here creating a little bit of uh, a layer of fluid between mjhl and the inner surface or undersurface of the subscapularis tendon so subscapularis tendon is okay only like a little minor cyst here of no clinical significance either so once we did that, we want to look at the muscles. This is mainly to assess the gutalier and the trophic and also, you know, any other things like edema and stuff. So we can see already the extravasation. We can talk about that. Then we don't see any atrophy. We just see some minor fatty streaks, which is gutalier one or two. Both is okay. And then there is no other like funny edema. We talked about this already. We talked about this already. And we don't see any edema in the infra or supraspinatus and in the deltoid, in the other parts of the deltoid also, we don't see any edema. And there is no axillary pathology, so we nothing wrong in the axillary region here. And when you scroll through, and I think this is what happened, you need to scroll all the way through and then you would have realized there's a second calcific deposit with a little bit of surrounding of edema here, calcific deposit here, same signal as here. And this is again hydroxyapatite deposition disease at the pectoralis major insertion coming down here, uh, having this layered appearance. This is a hydroxyapatite deposition there. I also accepted, you know, calcific tendinitis. I know if people were mentioning this one to be inside or close to the distal or my tendinous junction of the long head of the biceps tendon. So we can see long head of the biceps tendon goes down. This is the biceps tendon, my tendinous junction start, but this is adjacent to it. This is not inside the biceps tendon. And we can see the pectoralis major actually coming in here and a little bit of edema here too. This was one of the major criteria. And if people missed this second calcification, I actually disqualified the reports, which, yeah, it's a bit cheeky, but I think you can see it very nicely here. I think it's just the problem people stop scrolling here and then they missed this finding down there. It's well within inside the field of view. Um, and imagine this was not there, then this would be the only finding. And if you don't see this and, you know, patient has pain, this would be the explanation. If you miss it, then obviously that's not a great report. So that's why this was one of the major criteria and only eight radiologists saw this and had qualifying reports that I will show you later. Okay. So we did the soft tissues. Now let's move on to the rotator interval. Now in autograms, you can sometimes have a bit of contrast here, a bit of injection, or diffusion and whatever, but that's fine. We don't see any thickening of coracohumeral ligament. This is totally normal. The biceps tendon comes in nicely here. She's a bit older. Like if you give a little bit of tendinosis, you know, I didn't bother. We can see the biceps fully also is intact. No subluxation. That's okay. And then ultimately also inside the sulcus, there is nothing really wrong with the long end of the biceps tendon. It's nicely centered. Okay. What's this? Am I recording? Hello, Bildschirm. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. So it's nicely centered and there's no medial subluxation or anything like that. So totally fine. Again, this is the big infraspinatus calcification. This is the pectoralis major calcification. Okay. After this, we move into the joint itself. 
And here I was very generous with what was accepted in terms of descriptions. We don't see any cartilage defects at the humeral head. There's no bone marrow edema. The position here, this is quite standard position, you know, also high riding head and stuff like that. You know, some of it is positional and it's only like an indirect sign of rotator cuff tear. Like if we have an intact tendon, then it doesn't really matter anyways. And in terms of the labrum, there is a bit of a more prominent cleft or widened recess, except both. The posterior labrum shows signs of degeneration. There's this uh, posterior cleft here. You can see fraying of the labrum, maybe even like little tiny tears here, and then more fraying down here. But I was very generous with accepting most descriptions, or actually, or basically all of the descriptions because it's not clinically significant here. Patient is over 50 years and uh, labral degeneration is just okay. It was, I think, one of the minor points that people could get if they described something wrong with the labrum. But uh, yeah, so there is no, you know, Bankert lesion or Alpsa lesion or anything like that. I think this is just uh, a little bit of degeneration. And then we see the IGHL anterior band inserting here, a little bit of fraying here, but not really like a major pathology. Also, there is no hill sex lesion and um, there is no like loose bodies inside the joint. The glenoid cartilage is fine. Uh, there's also nothing wrong there. So you can see the case was a bit tricky first because it was an arthrogram which I didn't declare in fr uh, up front. Second, the second calcification at the pectoralis major insertion was missed by like most people, only eight people saw that. Now if you did the test, let me know in the comments if you saw this a priori without me telling you. Uh, it shows that if you go fast, we still need to look at all the images, I think. Um, so congrats to all the radiologists who actually saw this. And we will see the impact that this has uh, on the times that were supported. Okay, I showed you how the qualification worked in the knee case already. So I just want to highlight the major findings, the minor findings and the negative findings that I used to qualify the reports. And you can see major findings, they needed to be in the report in one way or the other. This would be the calcific tendinitis or hydroxyapatite deposition in the infrasmatus tendon and the second one at the pectoralis major tendon, even if the calcification was not allocated to the pectoralis major. If they saw the calcification, I counted it as a correct report. Labrum degeneration was just creating some minor points. We can forget about this now here, mainly because of age of the patient and not the right clinical context. And for this case, I actually added a disqualifying findings so of people who described the rotator cuff tear were disqualified. And I think it only really mattered in one or two cases where they saw both findings, but then were disqualified for describing some extensive tear of one of the tendons. Okay, now guess what was the time for the fastest shoulder MRI report? Just take a couple of seconds, make a number in your head, and then let's see if you were correct or not. Now, here is the list of reports, and you can see the first report came in after just 48 uh, 46 seconds but got disqualified for missing the calcific uh, tendinitis the second one and basically all the disqualifications were because of the missed second calcification second report two minutes then in three minutes 328 351 all got you know disqualified for missing the second calcific deposition and this keeps going on like this and then there was the first qualifying report coming in at four minutes 42 seconds so this was a bit cheeky because of this this otherwise we would have again very fast times now four minutes 42 seconds is still a very fast time for a shoulder MRI uh, you know don't get me wrong five minutes here the second person so these two were still very fast uh, very accurate as well because they saw a finding which was missed by most people and then you can see it goes down here six minute mark uh, everything got disqualified for missing that and then number three with seven minute 29 seconds and then seven minutes 50 four seconds and then everybody else got disqualified and then we got nine minutes, 10 minutes, 11 minutes, like a cluster of people who saw this, maybe they took a bit more time. And then lastly, after 15 minutes, this was the last qualifying report after 15 minutes, which I still allowed despite being over the time. One even took 19 minutes, but was not able to find this calcific tendon. And I think it shows you can take much time, you know, can take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you still don't see this. And this shows that the search pattern is such a key element for radiologists to not miss stuff like that, even if you are working fast. So time was, is no guarantee to actually see something which 
it's not small like if we go back to the case you know this is okay on the axle is hard to see but if you go to the sagittal you know this is not hard well it is hard to see but it's not a small thing it's, it's quite big and this is really if you just focus up here you might only scroll to this level because you just want to know the insertions at this level then it would just be on the next slice which you'd never really go there on a the t1 especially and even on the sagittal t2 you just look at these tendons here and it's so dark that you might not see it on the fat set you miss it on the sagittal and i think the coronal t1 is another one where you can actually see it but then you are maybe just focusing on stuff like that up here so search pattern should have included some form of skimming which i also recommend in my book so if you skim this study and you just briefly scroll like this it might actually pop out so try that next time okay so here we have the table plotted all the reports in disqualified in blue and qualified in green reports according to the minute bracket so you can see the four minute report is here the five minute report is here then we have two minute two reports at seven minutes which are here and you can see time is not really a thing everybody missed it we can see many reports were submitted below the seven minute mark or at the seven mark or below showing that people can report quite quickly and i think the fact that the second classification was missed must primarily the stress of the competition trying to be super fast maybe taking a little bit of shortcuts there or a lack of a proper search pattern or maybe just forget to skim i think these are the three options where i see why this was a bit tricky and funny enough the best performing radiologists in the ankle and the knee case were actually missing this uh, second classification so the whole overall you know ranking got a bit mixed up because of the shoulder case Okay, that was the shoulder case for the MSK Olympics and in the next video I'm going to show you the ankle case which I think was the best of the uh, three cases with an incredible time, something I wouldn't have bet money on, so go watch that video next.